Do you know any people who are homosexuals? No, thank you. I think it's um, disgraceful, you know? It's, it's just not right. No, no real opinion, I guess, so no real attitude on it. I feel sad for people who are homosexuals because it must be a difficult lifestyle for them. Why? Because it goes against the, the, uh, what people find acceptable. Well, what's your opinion on it? I don't have an opinion on it. What would you do if you found that your brother right was thing. gay? He is. <laughs> I do not, I've never had any homosexual tendencies, uh -huh. um, so I can't understand where they're coming from. Overly affectionate displays of sexual desire, uh -huh. sorry, sexual desire belong in the bedroom and not in the street. What do you mean flaunted on the rest well, of Well, they get these movements and they're up in arms because they're not getting certain privileges and rights and benefits that they want, like, you know, like uh, veterans benefits and uh -huh. <laughs> such as that. There's something wrong there uh, abnormally and I don't think it's normal. What do you uh, mean it's abnormal? Well, I mean that uh, it's not normal. I see you're wearing a pink triangle. Can you tell me why? Well, I'm a lesbian, and to me it's a sign of solidarity, and as I'm sure you know, I mean, it dates back to Nazi Germany and the rounding up of homosexuals, and I really do think we stand in continuity with these sisters and brothers who were killed, along with Jews and gypsies and others, for who they were. The Nazis wanted to create a new elite, and they wanted to breed it. And they thought that maybe in three generations, all Germans would be six foot two, blue blonde, and very, very strong. I left Germany in 1933 as a very young man, as a student. The day the parliament went up in flames, I had a couple of gay friends that disappeared. In 1935, you may, have, you may remember that the so-called Nuremberg Laws were published, which was directed against the Jews and made any sexual relationship between a Jew and a Gentile punishable by law. This was preceded by about three months by the new anti-homosexual laws, which were put into words uh, very exactly and defined that any activities of sexual nature between two men would be punishable first by two years in jail, then by three years in jail, and then later on by referral to a concentration camp. The state could not tolerate any pluralism, and a sexual diversion was considered heresy, just as a racial difference like the Jews were considered heresy. So when they finally realized they had all the power they wanted and Himmler's police directorates became more and more powerful and ate up all the old police forces until there was one gigantic police force run with a file card system of over 500,000 names. They systematically started to eradicate or annihilate anybody who was any different. The whole persecution of the gay, the annihilation experiment, is like a dress rehearsal for the later mass murder and mass persecution of huge groups of population, mostly the Eastern European Jews. The gays were taken to special camps. The first one was Dachau, which is the grandfather of all camps. And there was one called Sachsenhausen, there was one called Neuengamme, and there was also Buchenwalde and Mauthausen. In the camp, all prisoners had to wear certain insignia or badges. They were triangles. It probably came originally from coding the Jews. This goes back to the Middle Ages. The pink triangle was a slip of cloth in the form of a triangle with pink color, which faded usually, and it characterized the gaze. Very few survived. It's important to realize that both in the Middle Ages and in the German Holocaust that gays and radicals were in the vanguard, if one wants to use those terms, of those who were literally destroyed. Lesbians 
and gay men were called witches and that we went first. We serve some sort of function as victims and we obviously give the people who do the violence themselves in some cases a feeling of power but clearly there must be a, a larger purpose that seems almost unconsciously perceived by the people that rule the culture in which they need us to be victims or to be scapegoated. This is obviously going on now uh, with the Christian right. If God says it is wrong, it is wrong. Hey, look, we're opposed to homosexuality. We, we think that it, it, it undermines uh, any concept of the family. We, we believe that uh, there are great moral issues involved. Uh, I uh, agree with capital punishment, and I believe that homosexuality is one of those that could be coupled with uh, murder and, and other sins. But it would be the government that um, is, sits upon this land who would be executing the homosexuals. Can you imagine what it's like to see the world through the eyes of a child? A world turned upside down by immorality and a future filled with the horror of homosexuality. What's at stake? Your children, your civil rights, and yes, your community's morals. Don't let it spread. Paid for by Moral Majority of Santa Clara County. I think probably all of us have some sense of, of what homophobia is. That is the fear and hatred of uh, lesbians and gay men. I'm not sure that I understand fully what a uh, political purpose homophobia serves because I think in many ways it is dysfunctional. Uh, in other words, um, there are other groups in the society, some of which I am a member of, like women and like black people, who it's very clear that keeping us in our place has economic purposes and other, you know, very material uh, reasons that it is done. I think that the purpose that it serves more than those kinds of material things is an ideological purpose. In other words, that by having a sexual group, a group of people that you can define as queer, then another group of people get to define themselves as normal. Homophobia in the black community, of course, springs from some of the same roots that it does in the white community, but it is, I feel, more objectionable because I feel that black people and other people of color have such a relationship to the white power structure that they should get the idea that it's not really beneficial to oppress uh, their own members. And I think that um, because of the fact that like sexuality is probably the most difficult and sensitive and vulnerable thing that people, whatever their sexual identity, have to define that like by having um, this group of people, us, the queers, that uh, people who have lots of questions, deep feelings, um, pain around their sexual identity have this kind of scapegoat, safety valve group. What do you really feel about homosexuality? I think it's revolting, and it says in the Old Testament, it's an abomination against uh, God. Why is it revolting? It's revolting because anything uh, that goes against nature is revolting. And you feel like homosexuality goes against nature? I know it goes against nature. Can you tell me what your feelings are about homosexuality? I think they should be shot if you ask me. Well, you know. What do you mean you think that they should be shot? What you ask well, us this you know. for? I think that homophobia is, is even more potent in a lot of ways say, than other fears, even racial fear. I mean, there's no way that I could ever be black. Uh, but if I am not a gay person, there's a possibility that there may be some homosexuality in me, and that makes it all the more threatening. People continue to act as though there is one single unitary cause of homosexuality, when in fact we know that the development of sexuality is very complicated, very complex, uh, and that uh, both heterosexuality and homosexuality um, arise from a variety of factors, no one single factor. My own experience was that uh, the word gay was heard as equivalent to sex. Homosexuality equals sex, heterosexuality equals love. Um, that we became compartmentalized as purely you know, sexual objects or beings. I, I also dislike it because male homosexuals tend to prey on young boys. They want converts to their way of life and they want them young. Now, lesbians are not much better, but I never heard of them bothering little girls. Maybe they do, but I never heard of it. Uh, people recently raised some questions about my qualifications for working with psychotic patients, uh, not on any clinical grounds, 
but they want to know what did it mean that an openly identified gay psychiatrist would be working with people who were most uh, at risk, uh, most helpless. Uh, would I take advantage of them? It's such irony because the statistics, you know, are that it's heterosexual men, you know, 98, close to 100 percent of the time, who are guilty of molesting young children. It's not gay men and women. Uh, what you read in the psychiatric literature uh, has as, about as much relevance for the lives of gay, uh, gay men and lesbians as reading Gone with the Wind has for the lives of black people. It's nonsense. And I think it's sort of a narcissistic injury. It's difficult for a psychiatry to say we really don't know and that most of the myths and the stereotypes we have are just that. Uh, it's half-truths, uh, innuendos, and I think that's a, that's a difficult thing. Well, I don't think they should be deprived of any rights that we have, but I mean, they shouldn't be out there pushing on, on you know, ordinary folks that uh, don't happen to be gay. Because I don't go around telling everybody that I'm macho because I'm an ex-Marine, which I happen to be, and we found a, a Marine occasionally who turned to be gay, too, but that was demoralizing. It you was know, demoralizing? When yes, it's demoralizing. When you're up in the front trying to do your job and you find you got a fruit beside you, it's not the greatest. You shouldn't be telling people that you're gay, you know. And I think it's just not, it's not American, you know. It wasn't back in the 60s and the 50s, and it shouldn't be around now. Now, Mr. Adams, a charge has been made against you that you not only offered special dispensations for shine, in order to pacify the staff, but that you offered up bigger bait from time to time. To wit, subversives, homosexuals, in the Air Force and in the Navy. Did you ever do that, Mr. Adams? I did not. We got a definite answer on that, didn't we? That is correct, sir. You will always get a definite answer on that. There was under investigation in the Army at that time, and under the supervision of my office being investigated for the Secretary of the Army, some very serious allegations with reference to homosexual uh, behavior on the part of a group of Army officers at a large Army base in the South. Well, it wasn't in Tennessee, Mr. Adams. Right? No, sir, it was not. <laughs> Point of order, let's exclude Arkansas, too. I can do that, sir. Sure, would like to raise the point of order on behalf of South Dakota, but also be considered the South. I can exclude all of the states of the members of this committee. One of the reasons why I'm concerned about homophobia right now is that not only do we have the the reality and the, the growing reality of the right-wing movement in this country, but I think we have that coupled with an economic crisis and a profound cultural and social crisis. And it is in those moments of crisis that I think people are much more open to looking for scapegoats, are much more vulnerable to that kind of manipulation that the right-wing does, and are much more willing to target people as the cause of the problem, as opposed to looking to some of the systemic causes of the problem to pick out people who are on the edge, on the fringe, queer, not normal, sick, women, black, Chicanos, whatever they might be, but people who are not what is considered the mainstream. And I think it's going to get worse. What we're going to see is a rise of attacks, out and out physical attacks, on lesbians and gay men. The number of attacks on gay men and lesbians are increasing and increasing. At least that's what it looks like from the reports that we're getting. Um, the Chelsea Gay Association is getting about 10 to 20 complaints of assaults per week on their hotline. And that seems to be increasing as the months go by. The motivation of the attacks is not to get money or to get valuables, though that may be a part of the attack. The motivation of the attackers is to hurt and dominate and humiliate someone that they've decided is gay and they decide they don't like your lifestyle, they don't like the way we live, and they attack us because of that. And in the course of the attack, because that's why they're attacking us, there's a lot of verbal abuse, name calling, and insinuations. And unfortunately, we're really not talking about something that's a minor problem. We're talking about something that we're seeing, you know, three to five to ten assault victims in our emergency room every week. We're talking about men who are brought in 
admitted unconscious, who never regained consciousness. We're talking about people who are brought in dead, and we never know who they are until they're, you know, until they're identified by family members, um, you know, weeks later sometimes. The helping systems, the places that are supposed to make it easier for you to heal after this kind of an assault, are very often the very places that give you the least amount of help or re-victimize you. You know, the, the police officer that says, well, what did you expect? Um, the family that says, well, I told you if you were going to live that lifestyle, things like this would happen. The doctors, nurses, social workers who don't ask the right questions or who don't offer or don't really understand how terrifying it is to have had your life on the line because of your lifestyle. I've always had gay feelings, homosexual feelings. And what I mean by that is like I've always been attracted emotionally and physically to other men. And all through school, I've had a lot of incidents that have happened, such as like, you know, being attacked and being hurt by other kids. I had just walked out of one of my classes, I guess it was my first class, and I was heading toward my second class. And the day before, I had been shoved once by this person. And I noticed he butted in front of me. So I just, I didn't know what was going on. I, I, he definitely was an erratic movement, walked in front of me. So I just looked down and didn't, you know, didn't catch eyes with the person, you know, and just mind my own business. And next thing I knew, I was punched in the face. Um, and I just fell on the floor. I was just totally thunderstruck. And I fell on the floor, bleeding. And believe it or not, while I was walking to the nurse, you know, blood streaming from my face, there were some people still jeering me and saying, you fucking fa faggot, and you, you gross pig or whatever, you know, these things, I'm bleeding. And it just shows their lack of humanity, you know, it just shows that they're just irrational people. So I really had some bad, you know, um, bad scenes with, with my accepting being gay, since I always knew I was gay, I couldn't lie to myself about it, I always had to be truthful to myself, but doing that really was painful. And I got fat. I went up to like 217 pounds. That was my outlet, it was food, <laughs> which, you know, it could have been worse. It could have been drugs or something or pinball machines, but it was food. And then in 11th grade, I met Paul Gilbert. And he just very casually said to me, you know, I'm gay, nonchalant, <laughs> drop of the hat. And it was like, for me, it was like almost a revelation because nobody had ever said that to me, was ever actually happy with being gay. I realized that, you know, to live under a facade and to lie to yourself isn't worth it. You know, even if I am going to get punched out all the time, it's worth it, you know, to be truthful and to have friends and to be able to communicate. They should have some respect for other people that, you know, don't feel, you know, feel good about seeing somebody, you know. Because, you know, it makes you sick and stuff, saying, oh, he's gay or she's a lesbian and stuff. You know, it should be kept in your own home, definitely. It should be kept in your own home, definitely. People who don't define themselves as gay feel more powerful than I do. That seems to be true in cultures where the definition of what it is to be gay is different. That is, in a number of Latin American cultures, apparently, apparently in some parts, at least, of black American gay male culture, certainly in Mediterranean culture, in southern Italy and in Greece, uh, in North Africa, the definition of what it is to be gay differs. That is, it's all right for a man to have sex with another man as long as his position is literally on top of the other man. And the gay man is not somebody who, not simply somebody who has sex with another man, but he's the man on the bottom. There's a loathing of things female or feminine, and many times uh, homosexuals are seen as feminine um, and therefore hated for, for the same reasons that women are hated or oppressed in our society too. For a male to choose to uh, abandon a traditional sexual role, a role of power, and to identify uh, with another role is very threatening to people. I come from a culture where um, the man is like it. He is the 
one who rules the house, he has total control, he goes out to work, he can have um, more women outside, and the woman stays home, and she takes care of her children, and uh, she's there for him, for his use. And so, and the roles are really clearly defined, so then when, you be, when you're a lesbian, you don't fit those roles anymore. But there are a lot of women who belong to a group that I used to go to who have been in custody cases whose husbands have abused them because they're lesbians. They come in, they take their children away, they come in the middle of the night to see who they're sleeping with, they, um, they cause trauma for the children, the kids are drawn into court, it's made a moral issue, biblical statements are quoted, right? All of this to take a child away from the mother. And it, bec it just gets so intermixed around culture and family, everything just mingles in. So it's just not one, you know, like talking about being a Latina woman or being a mother or anything because I'm all of those things. And so I'm affected in different ways. But again, I'm a very lucky woman. I like who I am. I like being a lesbian. I love women. I like men too, but I love women better, you know. And so I, I'm very lucky. I'm really very lucky. Well, it's just about three years now. Sarah wrote me a letter saying that she was gay. And I think she had tried to tell me when she was home just before that. And apparently just couldn't bring herself to. At first, survival really seemed like the most I could hope for. Just somehow understanding it a little bit, accepting it, having to realize that expectations that I hadn't even been aware of uh, were being shattered. The expectation somehow that she would live her life more or less as I had. Um, eventually, presumably marry, have children. And I don't think I'd ever thought about that particularly. It wasn't, it hadn't seemed important until all of a sudden I realized that it probably wasn't going to happen at all. Seven months ago, my mother has, was asking me um, why wasn't I dating a girl? and why I wasn't planning on getting married, or when was I gonna get, gonna get married. And I tried to explain to her in Chinese, because she, she doesn't speak English whatsoever, that I'm gay. And the way I had to do it was to say, Ma, I love men. And she, she, her reaction was, um, I don't care. I don't care if you love men. You still have to get married. So here we are in a world that really wants to deny that homosexuality exists. And yet, as parents, we know it does. And those two very disparate views somehow have to be put together. I think there's a big variety of reaction. Some parents are very threatened and become very angry. Um, and feel that they've been rejected, betrayed, and that their children are somehow doing this deliberately to them. Uh, this, this seems to be one major uh, reaction. I think motivating me was a feeling that I really wanted Sarah's love. I wanted to be a part of her life. And so it was very important for me to do whatever I could, you know, within my own limitations to make that happen. When I came out, I had to totally alienate all my close friends. My closest friends, I couldn't tell them that I was gay because you, you grew up in Chinatown, I grew up in Chinatown right? and all my friends were Chinese until I decided I'm coming out. <laughs> and coming out and leaving, and getting no, not being able to get support from your own community, your friends, or not being able to, not even trying to, because you're afraid to, and then trying to go into a white, gay lifestyle and trying to fit in there, it didn't work. In Asian culture, I mean, I have my role as a woman, but there's no role at all for me as a lesbian. I think outside of Chinatown, in white America, say that the way gay people are, it's, it's a much more violent opposition to gay people. It's, it's queer bashing and fag bashing, and it's, it's an 
actively negative thing to be gay. Growing up as a little Chinese kid, all these ignorant white ideas brought on these people saying, calling me fag for no reason at all. Because it was, it was a racial thing. They needed someone to dump on, and they used the word fag, queer, sissy on me. Because you were Chinese, not because you were a sissy. Yeah. You know? And I think that's the way racism and homophobia they come from exactly the same fears on the part of white people. And, they, and, so, and so they use a homophobic expression, faggot, yeah. to really express a racist sentiment. Why is it considered bad, you think? I think the words come out of not really understanding what a homosexual really is or how that person feels, mm -hmm. you know, or why they are what they are. You know, it's just out of ignorance that the words come about. Like, you know, it's just like when um, black people would call niggas or white people would call honkies or whatever. Yeah, still you know? yeah. I mean, you know, it's like that's not what they are. They're not a honky or a nigga, but they're black and white. And, you know, they just come up with these words because out of ignorance, they don't really know what to say or how to respond to somebody that's different. Mm -hmm. It's because they're different. <clears throat> Yeah. I don't think America is ready to see us as who we really are yet. Healthy human beings. Yes, yes, exactly, healthy human beings. Gay men and lesbians have existed from the beginning of time in every culture, in every race, in, in every class, yeah, yeah, yeah. in every animal see, species. Hey, you're talking over here about peer pressure. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of peer pressure about being gay. I mean, like, even if you're socializing with the person who's yeah. a faggot, if you're one of your friends see him, you know what? That's like the end of your friendship. Yeah. You can forget about talking to them for a couple of years. <laughs> Why is that? Because they think you're one of them. You know, they're saying, well, he socializes with them. Don't talk to him. To me, it was a really natural thing to do, to, to be gay. Um, being gay to me is being physically and emotionally attracted to members of my same sex, but at the same time, really loving and enjoying the company of people of the opposite sex, too. And one thing that I really wanted to get across was the fact that I am gay because I'm attracted to other men, not because I'm repulsed against women. I mean, that's another one of the myths. I think one, one big breakthrough for me was realizing that, that love is beautiful. That's one thing my mother told me, and it, you know, it has stuck with me for a long time. She said, Hillary, the important thing is that you, know, you, you have that love in yourself, in your heart. If you can share that with someone, that is beautiful. I mean, there's so much hate in this world. It was, you know, and that was really beautiful for me to hear, especially from my mother. It really touched me deeply. Society only allows you to go but so deep. And it's just like when you're a small child, you know, things, I don't know, it's like, like I was saying, you know, when you run and used to jump hopscotch, you know, that was, that was it, you know, and then all of a sudden you got into guys and your mother said, no, 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 I don't want you going out with boys, you know, and then you grew up and you started to deal with that and then now you're dealing with womanhood, you know, you have to go out and you have to work and it was like, damn, you know, I didn't know it was this hard. And to be gay, it takes a lot more just to be able to have a relationship like that and to let people know about it is even harder. It takes a long time to start doing that. It's like a growth of society, you know. Yeah. Things are changing, but you're so used to it being one way that it takes a real long time for the whole flow of people to start understanding. Yeah, a lot of courage. Yeah. yeah. Graduation was pretty much just like anybody else's graduation. It was just a regular end of your four years in high school. The only difference was that I wore a pink triangle on my gown. Um, I wore it, you know, like this one. Uh, I wore it in, like, sort of like in memoriam for all the other gay people who fought for what they believed in or possibly who fought for what they believed in just by being who they were and just, which some people don't realize that, that um, some gay people have to fight every day of their lives. So when I walk, got up to the stadium, up uh, to the podium, um, the entire bleachers, the, the people in the bleachers, which would be the parents, the teachers, and maybe brothers and sisters, booed. They booed for me. But the kids all cheered. It was the strangest thing. The kids, or the majority of the kids, were cheering. So I heard this, you know, I heard the, hear this cacophony of noises, but the booing from in front of me, and I turned around and I just bowed to all the students who were cheering. It's going to be a bloody battle. There's no easy way for it to come about. Uh, there's going to be some bad medicine coming down the line. Uh, but the victory is the Lord's.
After the Allies liberated the camps, the Americans and the British were so terrified and horrified by what they saw that they went all out to help the prisoners. Of course, there was first an enormous confusion. Some of the gay prisoners simply slipped out. They took off the pink triangle, they put on the red triangle or another triangle. They slipped out, they went back to regular life. Sometimes an American legal officer would find out what pink triangle meant. And some of them were legalistic and said, oh, those are criminals. And they have to sit out their sentence and were sent back to jail. I really will not make a prediction for modern day, but it seems to me clear, if you look at the whole picture, that any society that is under indomitable stress, that cannot deal with the problems, that feels a fabric of society disintegrated, will look for scapegoats. And there are always scapegoats around. Um, the gays are always a very welcome scapegoat. And if in our modern times it should come to pass that even America, one of the most powerful countries in the world, feels it is at the edge of an abyss, they might turn and repeat in another way the pattern of the Nazis. So I think the, the next period of time is going to be very hard for us and that it's going to be hard for a lot of other people too. And I think that probably in the long run our most effective challenge to homophobia will be in our ability to link up with other struggles, with other people struggling against sexism, against racism, against the class nature of this society, against the role of the United States and other countries of the world, etc. The powerful thing about the movement, our movement, the combined women's and men's movement and the gay and lesbian movement, is that we are learning to accept our diversity. And because of that, we have a lot to teach straight people. We know what it's like to be a minority, and we respect other minority rights. And that's the most powerful thing about the gay movement. This is the most humanistic movement happening in the United States right now. I'm here because I'm really concerned about the attacks on the gay community that's coming from the moral majority and the new right. I'm not gay myself, but I wanted to show support and solidarity for the gay community and the gay rights movement. And I feel that freedom and liberation is indivisible, and attacks on the gay community are attacks on all of us.